Welcome back to Anne of Green Gables. We are doing chapter six and seven today. Pages 42 to 51. Your words are benevolent, blight, cooperated, heedlessness, provid prov providential, bustling, ottoman, stipulations, wiry, fractious, disposed, disposed, and transfigured, and gimlet, vim, to put your oar in, mortal, harrowed, admonished, glibly, heathen, Reproachfully, assented, irreverence, mance. And then we have three questions. So possibly you have three questions today. Number one, why would Anne not want to go with Mrs. Blewett? Number two, why was Matthew's face a glow of delight? Number three, why did Anne include, please let me stay at Green Gables in her prayer? All right, here we go. Oh, right there. All right, here we go. Chapter six and seven, I got a bustle. What? They're 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 pretty yeah. So which is why I combined them, right? Get there they did. However, in due season, Mrs. Spencer lived in a big yellow house at White Sands Cove, and she came to the door with surprise and welcome mingled on her benevolence, characterized by or expressing goodwill or kindly feelings. So she's got a kind face. Benevolent face. Dear, dear, she exclaimed. You're the last folks I was looking for today, but I'm real glad to see you. You'll put your horse in. And how are you, Anne? I'm as well as can be expected, thank you, said Anne, smilelessly. A blight seemed to have descended on her. Blight is something that frustrates plans or hopes. I suppose we'll stay a little while to rest the mare, said Marilla, but I promised Matthew I'd be home early. The fact is, Mrs. Spencer, there's been a queer mistake somewhere, and I've come to see where it is. We sent word, Matthew and I, for you to bring us a boy from the asylum. We told your brother Robert to tell you we wanted a boy 10 or 11 years old. Marilla Cuthbert, you don't say so, said Mrs. Spencer in distress. Why, Robert sent the word down by his daughter, Nancy, and she said you wanted a girl, didn't she, Flora Jane, appealing to her daughter who had come out to the steps. She certainly did, Miss Cuthbert, cooperated Flora Jane earnestly. Cooperated means to support with evidence, to make more certain or back up. I'm dreadfully sorry, said Mrs. Spencer. It's too bad, but it certainly wasn't my fault. You see, Miss Cuthbert, I did the best I could, and I thought I was following your instructions. Nancy is a terribly flighty thing. I've often had to scold her well for her heedlessness. Heedlessness means inconsiderate or thoughtless. It was our own fault, said Marilla resignedly. We should have come to you ourselves and not left an important message to be passed along by word of mouth in that fashion. Anyhow, the mistake has been made and the only thing to do is to set it right. Can we send the child back to the asylum? I, I suppose they'll take her back, won't they? I, I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully, but I don't think it'll be necessary to send her back. Mrs. Peter Blewett was up here yesterday, 
And she was saying to me how much she was she'd sent by me for a little girl to help her. Mrs. Peter had a large family, you know, and she finds it hard to get help. Anne will be the very girl for her. I call it positively providential. Providential means opportune, fortunate, or lucky. Marilla did not look as if she thought providence had much to do with the matter. Here was an unexpectedly good chance to get this unwelcome orphan off her hands, and she did not even feel grateful for it. She knew Mrs. Peter Blewett only by sight as a small, shrewd-faced, shrewdish-faced woman without an ounce of superfluous super, super flesh on her bones. So basically, she doesn't have an extra ounce of flesh on her bones. She's just skin and bones, and uh, she looks like a shrew. So she's kind of like beady-eyed and shrew. like a mouse. It's in the mouse family. Oh, yeah, I know what a shrew is. Okay. But she had heard of her, a terrible worker and driver, Mrs. Peter was said to be, and discharged servant girls... Discharge means they're fired. Servant girls told fearsome tales of her temper and stinginess. So she's not tolerant, right? And her family of pert, quarrelsome children. Marilla felt a qualm of conscience at the thought of handing Anne over to her tender mercies. Well, I'll go in and we'll talk the matter over, she said. And if there isn't Mrs. Peter coming up the lane this blessed minute, explained, explained Mrs. Spencer, bustling her guest through the hall into the parlor. Bustling, bustling means to move with, <clears throat> to move or act with a great show of energy. So she's bustling her, the, her guest through the hall into the parlor where a deadly chill struck on them as if the air had been strained so long through the dark green, closely drawn blinds that had lost every particle of warmth it had ever possessed. That is real lucky, for we can just settle this matter right away. Take the armchair, Marilla Cuthbert, and you sit here on the ottoman. It's an overstuffed footstool. And don't wiggle. Don't wriggle. Let me take your hats. Flora Jane, go out and put the kettle on. Good fortune, or good afternoon, Mrs. Blewett. We were just saying how fortunate it was to have you happen along. Let me introduce you two ladies, Mrs. Blewett, Miss Cuthbert. Please excuse me for a moment. I forgot to tell Flora Jane to take the buns out of the oven. So she's putting the kettle on, so she's going to serve tea most likely. And tea a lot of times is served with like some kind of a yummy thing to eat. Mrs. Spencer whisked away after pulling the blind up the blinds and sitting mutely, so she's not talking, on the ottoman with her hands clasped tightly in her lap, stared at Mrs. Blewett as one fascinated. Was she to be given into the keeping of this sharp-faced, sharp-eyed woman? She felt a lump coming up in her throat and her eyes smarted painfully. If your eyes are smarting, you're probably what? Trying not to cry or crying, right? Yep. She was beginning to be afraid. She couldn't keep the tears back when Mrs. Spencer returned, flushed and beaming, quite capable of taking any and every difficult physical, mental, or spiritual into consideration. Oh, every difficulty, physical, mental, or spiritual into consideration and settling it out of hand. It seems there's been a mistake about this little girl, Mrs. Blewett, she said. I was under the impression that Mr. and Miss, Mr. And Miss Cuthbert wanted a little girl to adopt. I was certainly told so. But it seems it was a boy they wanted. So if you're still of the same mind you were yesterday, I think she's just the thing for you. Mrs. Blewett darted her eyes over Anne from head to foot. How old are you and what's your name, she demanded. 
and and surely faltered the shrinking child not daring to make any stipulations which is conditions or demands so she's not making any stipulations regarding the spelling thereof of her name, right? So when she met Matthew, remember, she said, my name is Anne, it's spelled with an E. When she met Marilla, she said, my name is Anne, and it's spelled with an E. And now she's faced with Mrs. Wood. Is she saying, my name is Anne, it's Anne spelled with an E? No, she's not. Hmph, you don't look as if there was much to you. Well, you're wiry. I, I don't know, but the wiry, wiry ones are the best after all. Wiry means lean or skinny. Um, well, if I take you, you'll have to be a good girl, you know. Good and smart and respectful. I'll expect you to earn your keep, and no mistake about that. Yes, I suppose. I might as well take her off your hands, Miss Cuthbert. The baby's awfully fractious. Or unruly irritable. And I'm clean worn out from attending to him. If you like, I can take her right home now. Merla looked at Anne and softened at the sight of the child's pale face with its look of mute misery. The misery of a helpless little creature who finds itself once more caught in the trap from which it had escaped. Marilla felt an uncomfortable conviction that if she denied the appeal of that look, it would haunt her to her dying day. Moreover, she did not fancy Mrs. Blewett to hand a sensitive, high-strung child over to such a woman. No, she could not take responsibility of doing that. Well, I I don't know, she said slowly. I didn't say that Matthew and I had absolutely decided that we wouldn't keep her. In fact, I may say that Matthew is disposed or inclined to keep her. I just came over to find out how the mistake had occurred. Is that the truth? No, she was going to send her back, right? And now that she's in the face of Mrs. Blewett, she's like, I don't know. Time and not now. Um, so I just came over to see, find out how the mistake had occurred. I think I'd better take her home again and talk it over with Matthew, I feel I oughtn't to decide on anything without consulting him. If we make up our mind not to keep her, we'll bring her or send her over to you tomorrow night. If we don't, you may know that she is going to stay with us. Would that suit you, Mrs. Blewett? I suppose it'll have to, said Mrs. Blewett ungraciously. During Marilla's speech, a sunrise had been dawning on Anne's face. First, the look of despair faded out. Then came a fl faint flush of hope. Her eyes grew deep and bright as the morning stars. The child was quite transfigured. Transfigured means to change in outward form or appearance. A and a moment later, when Mrs. Spencer and Mrs. Blewett went out in quest of a recipe the latter had come to borrow, she sprang up and flew across the room to Marilla. <gasps> oh, oh, Miss Cuthbert, did you really say that perhaps you would let me stay at Green Gables? She said in a breathless whisper, as if speaking aloud might shatter the glorious possibility. D did you really say it? Or did I only imagine that you did? I think you'd better learn to control that imagination of yours, Anne. And if you can't distinguish between what is real and what isn't, said Marilla crossly. Yes, you did hear me say that, say just that and no more. It isn't decided yet, and perhaps we will conclude 
to let Mrs. Blewett take you after all. She certainly needs you more, much more than I do. I'd rather go back to the asylum than to live with her, said Anne passionately. She looks exactly like a, like a gimlet. A gimlet is a small tool with like a screw point. No, but I thought it would help you understand what it was. With a screw point as a gimlet. Marilla smothered a smile under the conviction that Anne must be reproved. So she must get in trouble for such a speech. A little girl like you should be ashamed of talking so about a lady and a stranger, she said severely. Go back and sit down quietly and hold your tongue and behave as a good girl should. I'll try to do and be anything you want me to, if you'll only keep me, said Anne, returning meekly to her ottoman. When they arrived back at Green Gables that evening, Matthew met them in the lane. Marilla, from afar, had noted him prowling along it and guessed his motive. She was prepared for the relief she read in his face when he saw that she had brought Anne back with her. But she said nothing to him. Relative to the affair, until they were both out in the yard behind the barn, milking the cows. Then she briefly told him Anne's history and the result of the interview with Mrs. Spencer. I wouldn't give a dog I like to that blue woman, said Matthew with unusual vim. Vim means enthusiasm. I don't fancy her style myself, admitted Marilla, but it's that or keeping her ourselves, Matthew. And since you seem to want her, I suppose I'm willing or have to be. I've been thinking over the idea until I got, I've got kind of used to it. It seems a sort of duty. I've never brought up a child, especially a girl. And I dare say I'll make a terrible mess of it. But I'll do my best. So far as I'm concerned, Matthew, she may stay. Matthew's shy face was a glow of delight. Well now, I reckon... You'd come to see it in that light, Marilla, he said. She's such an interesting little thing. It'd be more to the point if you could say she was a useful little thing, retorted Marilla. But I'll make it my business to see she's trained to be that. And mind, Matthew, you're not to go interfering with my methods. Perhaps an old maid doesn't know much about bringing up a child. But I guess she knows more than an old bachelor. So you just leave me to manage her. When I fail, it'll be time enough to put your oar in. To put your oar in means to insert your opinion when it wasn't asked for. So like if I ask for, um, I ask one friend for the answer and somebody else inserts the answer, that's putting their oar in. Okay, because I didn't ask them. There, there, Marilla, you can have your own way, said Matthew reassuringly. Only be as good and kind to her as you can without spoiling her. I think she's one of the sort you can do anything with if you only get her to love you. Marilla sniffed to express her contempt for Matthew's opinion concerning anything feminine and walked off to the dairy with the pails. I won't tell her she can that I won't tell her tonight that she can stay, she reflected, as she strained the milk into the creamers. She'd be so excited she wouldn't sleep a wink. Marilla Cuthbert, you're fairly in for it. Did you ever suppose you'd see the day when you'd be adopting an orphan girl? It's surprising enough, but not so surprising as that Matthew should be at the bottom of it. Him that always seems to have such a mortal dread. Mortal means of or relating to death. 
So he's like rather die than deal with women. Okay. What? Well, that's basically what it means, right? He'd rather die than deal with a girl. Or mortal dread, like, um, it's, it's about, like, death to him to have to talk to a woman. That'll actually play later on into the story. This is kind of foreshadowing. Anyhow, we've decided on the experiment, and goodness knows what will come of it. Chapter 7, Anne says her prayers. When Marilla took Anne up to bed that night, she said stiffly, now, Anne, I noticed last night you threw your clothes all about the floor when you took them off. That is very untidy habit, and I can't allow it at all. As soon as you take off any article of clothing, fold it neatly and place it on the chair. I haven't any use for little girls who aren't neat. I was so harried up in my mind. Harrowed means... Tormented, vexed, or distressed. That I didn't think about my clothes at all, said Anne. I'll fold them nicely tonight. They always made us do that at the asylum. Half of the time, though, I'd forget. I'd be in such a hurry to get into bed, nice and quiet, and imagine things. You'll have to remember a little better if you stay here, admonished Marilla. Admonished means to express warning or disapproval. There's that, there, that looks like, looks something like, uh, you'll have to be, you'll, okay, you'll have to remember a little better if you stay here, admonished Marilla. There, that looks something like, say your prayers now and get into bed. I never say any prayers, announced Anne. Marilla looked horrified astonishment. <clears throat> Why, Anne, what do you mean? Were you never taught to say your prayers? God always wants little girls to say their prayers. Don't you know who God is, Anne? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, responded Anne promptly and glibly. Glibly means marked by ease and informality. Marilla looked rather relieved. So you do know something then, thank goodness. You're never, you're not quite a heathen. Heathen means an unconverted member of a people or nation who does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. Okay. It's a long one, sorry. Um, where did you learn that? Oh, at the Asylum Sunday School. They made us learn the whole catechism. I liked it pretty well. There's something splendid about the words infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Isn't that grand? It has such a roll to it, just like the big organ playing. So this is talking about the instrument organ, not your body organs, right? Just like the big organ playing. You couldn't quite call it poetry, I suppose, but it sounds a lot like it, doesn't it? We're not talking about poetry, Anne. We're talking about saying your prayers. Don't you know it's terrible? It's a terrible, wicked thing not to say your prayers every night? I'm afraid you are a very bad little girl. You would find it easier to be bad than good if you had red hair, said Anne reproachfully. I think we did, I just realized. With rebuke or disapproval? Yeah. Okay, sorry. People who haven't red hair don't know what trouble is. Mrs. Thomas told me that God made my hair red on purpose. And I've never cared about him since. In any way, anyhow, I'd o always be too tired at night to bother saying prayers. People who have to look after twins can't be expected to say their prayers. Now, do you honestly think they can? Marilla decided that Anne's religious training must be begun at once. Plainly, there was no time to be lost. You must say your prayers while you are under my roof, Anne. Why, of course, if you want me to, assented Anne. Assented means to agree to or approve of something. Cheerfully. 
I do anything to oblige you, but you'll have to tell me what to say for this once. After I get into bed, I'll imagine out a real nice prayer to say always. I believe that it will be quite interesting now that I come to think of it. You must kneel down, said Marilla in embarrassment. Anne knelt at Marilla's knee and looked up gravely. Why must people kneel down to pray? If I really wanted to pray, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd go out into a great big field all alone or into a deep, deep woods. And I'd look up into the sky, up, up, up into the lovely blue sky that looks as if there was no end to its blueness. And then I just feel a prayer. Well, I'm ready. What am I supposed to say? Marilla felt more embarrassed now than ever. She had intended to teach Mar Anne the childish classic, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. But she had, as I have told you, the glimmerings of a sense of humor, which is simply another name for a sense of fitness of things. And it suddenly occurred to her that the simple... Little prayer, sacred to white-robed childhood, lisping at motherly knees, was entirely unsuited to this freckled witch of a little girl, who knew nothing, who knew and cared nothing about God's love, since she had never had it translated to her through the medium of human love. You're old enough to pray for yourself, Anne, she said finally. Just thank God for your blessings and ask him humbly for the things you want. Well, I'll do my best, promised Anne, burying her face in Marilla's lap. Gracious Heavenly Father, that's the way the ministers say say it in church. So, I'm, so I suppose it's all right in private prayer, isn't it? She interjected, lifting up her head for a moment. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank thee for the white way of delight and the lake of shining waters and Bonnie and the Snow Queen. I'm really extremely grateful for them. And that's all the blessings I can think of now to thank thee, thee, thee for. And for the things I want, they're so numerous that w it would take a great deal of time to name them all. So I will only mention the two most important. Please let me stay at Green Gables, and please let me be good-looking when I grow up. I remain yours respectfully, Anne Shirley. There, did I do it all right? She said eagerly, getting up. I could have made it much more flowery if I had a little more time to think it over. Poor Marilla was only preserved from complete collapse by remembering that it was not irreverence, lack of reverence or respect, but simply spiritual ignorance on the part of Anne that was responsible for this extraordinary petition. She tucked the child up in bed, mentally vowing that she should be taught a prayer the very next day, and was leaving the room when the with the light when Anne called her back. I've, I've just thought of it now. I should have said amen in place of yours respectfully, shouldn't I? The way the ministers do, I'd forgotten it, but I felt a prayer should be finished off in some way, so I put in the other. Do you suppose it'll make any difference? I, I don't suppose it will, said Marilla. Go to sleep now like a good child. Good night. I can only say good night tonight with a clear conscience, said Anne, cuddling luxuriously down among the pillows. Marilla retreated to the kitchen, set the candle firmly in the ta on the table, and glared at Matthew. Matthew Cuthbert, it's about time somebody adopted that child and taught her something. She's next door to a perfect heathen. Will you believe she never said a prayer in her life till tonight? I'll send her to the manse. Manse is how a house and land occupied by a minister or a parson. I'll send her to the manse tomorrow and borrow the peep of the day series. That's what I'll do, and she shall go to Sunday school just as soon as I can get some suitable clothes made for her. I foresee that I shall have my hands full. Well, well, we can't get through this world without our share of trouble. I've had a pretty easy life so far, life of it so far, but my time has come, and at last, I suppose I shall have to make the best of it. 
All right, I will type in your assignment so you have to follow what's on, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye.